Okay, so my name is Ravi Mueller, and I'm, I guess I'm a rookie. Uh, so <laughs> I'm one of the elder interns here at Imago Day, uh, and I'm honored to have this uh, opportunity to preach this morning. Uh, we're going to be continuing in our series on First Peter. Uh, the passage today is super short. It's just half a verse, uh, but it really packs a punch. Uh, the topic is humility. Uh, so I'd like to just start off by kind of asking you guys, who here would like to grow in humility? Could I, could I have you raise your hand? All right, great. Well, good news. You guys are in luck because I've prepared a phenomenal sermon on humility. I'm, I'm super proud of it. It's really, really good. Um, yeah, uh, that's, that's a pride joke. For, <laughs> so that's okay. Try not to. Okay, all jokes aside, though, um, I think really all of us can appreciate that humility is a desirable virtue to have, and it's probably an area that we can all grow in. Uh, But I wonder if we have a true understanding of what really gospel-centered humility is and what the implications of that would be in our lives, how we can live that out. Uh, But before I get any further, I just want to lay my cards on the table and confess that I am not a subject expert in humility. Uh, I have a lot to grow in this area. Man, am I doing something? No. <laughs> um, I have a lot to grow in the, in the area of humility. Uh, but I feel like I'm in good company here uh, because the author of this passage that teaches us on humility, the Apostle Peter, uh, he's kind of famous for his uh, pride-filled responses in the Bible, right? Uh, take, for instance, the day before Jesus was crucified, right? Jesus is talking to Peter, and he's saying, Hey, Peter, before the cock crows, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Then Peter, in his pride, thinking, Hey, I, I know myself better than what God knows me. So he says, Hey, Jesus, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Right? But then we read, what, about like 30 verses later, and then we hear, cock a doodle doo <laughs> uh, Peter's denying Jesus, Right? So, uh, I find in Peter someone like me, uh, someone with a messed up, pride-filled heart, someone that uh, needs to grow in humility, um, and just ask God to do, to do that for him. So, uh, that's where I'll stop comparing myself to the Apostle Peter, uh, but suffice to say, I need this sermon just as much as uh, anyone in here. So, I'll be preaching to myself this morning, uh, and you guys can just feel free to listen in if, if you'd like. So, Uh, Let me pray for us, and then we'll kind of dive into God's word and examine uh, true gospel-centered humility. Heavenly Father, uh, I thank you for your good and perfect word. God, I pray as as we read your word this morning, I pray that you would convict us and humble us. God, we all need growth in this this area of our lives, and we're dependent on you. We need you to work in us. I pray that you would this morning. Draw us close to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so our passage for today is 1 Peter 5, 5b. It's the second half of verse 5. Uh, but to get this verse in context, I'd like to just read 1 Peter 5, 1, all the way through the end of verse 5. So if you don't have a Bible with you, the words will be up on the screen. Otherwise, there should be a Bible somewhere in the uh, seat backs in front of you. So feel free to turn to 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5. It says, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So Pastor Pete preached last week uh, on how the Apostle Peter here starts off his instructions to the elders. and says, hey elders, you need to shepherd the flock of God, that is the church. You need to care for them. And then the Apostle Peter kind of zooms out a little bit and then says, church, you need to be subject to and submit to the elders. And then he zooms out a little bit more and universalizes his instruction, right? The Apostle Peter says, all of us, all of you, everyone, is to clothe ourselves in humility, right? So we're called to be humble. The reason stated for this is that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This quote, that God opposes the proud 
and gives grace to the humble is actually a quote from Proverbs 3.34. Uh, the translation in, from Hebrew changes the English a little bit, but the quote is the same. It says, Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. This quote is also found in James chapter 4, verse 6, where it says, But he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. So I think it's probably easy to see here, you don't need a, a doctorate in theology, that the, the goal of these verses here is humility, right? And specifically gospel-centered humility. And the opposite of humility is pride. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So I'd like to just start off by kind of tackling what, what pride is, and then we can talk about what humility is and how we can live that out in our lives. So first, uh, let's talk about pride. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, asks his readers a, a rather simple question. He just asks, are you prideful? Right? And then he kind of cleverly concludes that if you don't think you're prideful, you are very prideful indeed. <laughs> right? I like the way that he says that. He's kind of he's a witty guy. But he essentially says the fact that you don't, if you don't think you're prideful, that right there just illustrates that you are prideful. Right? So Lewis states that kind of Pride is essentially competitive by nature. And really, it's, it's the complete anti-God state of mind. It's the utmost evil. It's the sin that made the devil fall. And it's really the sin that leads to all other sins. And then pride is really, I guess you could define it as an exalted sense of who you are in relation to God and others. Pride is an exalted sense of who you are in relation to God and others. So C.S. Lewis also goes on to say that, contrary to popular belief, you're not actually prideful about being rich, or you're not prideful about being good-looking. What you're actually prideful about is being richer or better-looking than the person next to you, right? Because if, if everyone was rich, or if everyone was just as good-looking as you, then there'd be nothing to be prideful about, right? So pride is competitive. And pride takes on its ugliest form when we're in competition with God, right? So how, how this looks, for example, with me, I'm prideful about being wise, right? I, I think I'm wiser than God, that I know what's best for me more so than what God says is best for me. So I'll, I'll take resting, for example. I'm a workaholic. I like to work, always working, I like to stay busy. Uh, I don't rest, and I don't rest well. But I know in God's word, God commands us to rest. He says, resting is what's best for you. It's good to rest and to trust in me. Uh, but me and my pride, I, I tell myself, no, no, that's, resting is, that's for the weak people, right? That's, that's not for me. What I need, what, what's best for me is to uh, brew a pot of coffee, uh, keep working, and just stay up till 2 a.m., right? That's, that's really what's best for me. No, in my pride, I think I, I know what's best for me more so than what God does, and it's it's really, it's, it's foolish, right? Uh, I also want you guys to think that I'm, I'm wise, I'm wiser, more intelligent than the average bear, right? That's why I spent so much time on this sermon to kind of impress you guys, to make you think I'm, I'm so wise, right? <sighs> another, another fail. Okay. I'm also prideful about being in control. You know, I think I'm ultimately the one that's in control of my circumstances, uh, a recent struggle for me in this area of my life relates to kind of growing our family. Uh, my wife and I got married about three years ago, and our plan was to be married for a year, you know, get the, get the marriage thing figured out, you know, because you can do that in a year, right? Just be uh, an expert at marriage. And then after a year, right, once we have it figured out, then we'd have a, then we'd have a family, right? Then we could grow our family. Well, uh, that time is coming past, and uh, we still don't have that family. Uh, I wanted, I had this plan, I had this vision of our life going a certain way, uh, but that wasn't what God had in mind. You know, I found myself uh, upset uh, at my unmet expectations and kind of frustrated that I wasn't in control, but yet still feeling like I was in control, like I can, I can change this, right? I was being prideful. But enough about me, how about, how about you? <laughs> what are you guys prideful about? I mean, you can be prideful about anything. You can be prideful about your, your jobs, your kids, your car, 
your intelligence, your performance, your humility. I mean, you could be prideful about being humble, right? So what, what is it though? What, what is it for you? you know, what do you use to, to lift yourself up and to minimize God? How do you make much of yourself and make little of, of God? How do you see yourself comparing and competing with others? You know, how are you competing against God? Consider maybe the last five things that you posted on Facebook or Twitter, or Instagram, Snapchat, whatever social media you guys, you kids are using these days. Now, what, what did those posts do? What did those posts highlight? Did they highlight you? Build yourself up? Or did they highlight God? Did they demonstrate how you are maybe smarter, funnier, better looking, wittier, richer, more important than others? Now, sometimes pride can be a, maybe a little more hidden or deceiving, though. Um, maybe you can disguise your pride really well. Uh, you could say things to cover up your pride, right? Instead of saying, well, I'm so proud of this, you can say, well, I'm so humbled. <laughs> I'm so humbled by this job promotion and, you know, fancy car that I got. It's, it's so humbling to have a Corvette, right? Um, instead of saying, you know, Hey, you should be thankful that I bent over backwards for you. That's what, that's what you're really, that's what your heart says. Something comes out like, oh, it's nothing. Anyone would have done it, right? But you're, you're really, you're disguising your pride. Right? Or perhaps you disguise your pride by being halfway real with people. You, you share the, the little sins and convictions that you have in your life, you know, you let people in just enough to show you, to show them that you got you got some sin issues in your life, but really they're pretty minor. You know, really you're you're a good Christian when it's all said and done. But you don't let people in on the the big struggles. You know, you're not vulnerable and transparent with the big sin issues in your life. Because man, if the people knew about those sin issues, then you know they wouldn't look to you as the the model of Christianity that they do now, right? No, I'm not, I'm not sure what you're prideful about. And, and you might not be either. But church, I would say that the, the very fact that you don't know what you're prideful about could be the result of kind of this blinding effect of sin, sin-filled pride in your life. So I, I really think that it's to your soul's benefit here to, to dig deep, to, to search and examine your heart, and to ask God to reveal to you what, what you are prideful about. But I wouldn't stop there. I would, I would pray, to, pray to God that he would reveal what you're prideful about, but then I would encourage you to repent and, and turn to him. Because our, our Father is, is loving and gracious to forgive that sin. Our sin-filled pride is really at the very heart of our sin. Uh, and and God, God hates it. God hates our pride. It says God opposes the proud. And that's a sobering warning, church. The destructive effects of, of pride can themselves be a warning in our life, which really, honestly, is a, is a sign of God's grace, <laughs> that the destructive effects of pride can be a warning. Uh, I see this as a, as a professor. I, I see this with my students, right? Like, I, I give them warnings. I give them instructions to, to study. <laughs> and then sometimes in their arrogant pride, they say, no, I'm, I'm not going to study for this. And they, they suffer the consequences, right? And the consequences could be that they fail the test or they might even fail the course. And, the, and that's just from resisting the, the warning or not heeding the instructions of just a, a mere professor. But imagine the effects of resisting the instructions of a holy God. But if we, if we really want to see the ultimate effect of our pride, we have to look to the cross. So at the cross, Jesus took on all of our pride. He took on our self-centered pride, the pride in our wisdom, the pride in our looks, the pride in our success, the pride in our humility. He took that all on him on the cross, and God opposed him. God opposed him to death. Jesus died in our place, paid the penalty for our sin, was opposed by God so that we wouldn't have to be. Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many and freed us from our pride and its ultimate effect on our life. So praise be to God for that. The flip side to the warning that God opposes the proud 
is a promise. The promise is that God gives grace to the humble. Okay, so let's look again at, uh, at our passage. 1 Peter 5.5b, 5, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Pastor John Piper states that if the God of the universe is opposing you, that's a, that's a bad thing. You know, that's it's pretty much the worst thing in the world, right? Things are not going to end well for you then. But if that same God of the universe, if that God is, is for you, is gracious to you, then that, that's, that's the best news in the world. And that's the promise that we have in this verse. God gives grace to the humble. So I, th- I think it would be helpful here to clarify what is humility and then how, how can we live this out in our lives then. So for the rest of the message, I like to try and focus on those two, two points. What is humility and how do we live this out? Earlier, we defined pride as an exalted view of ourselves. So humility, then, is an accurate view. Humility is an accurate view of ourselves. Not an exalted view, but not a diminished view either. It's an accurate view of who we are in relation to God and others. C.J. Mahaney, in his book, Humility, True Greatness, defines humility as honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. And for the Christian, this kind of, this vertical assessment of who we are in relation to God's holiness and our sinfulness reveals a couple things. It reveals that you are a redeemed, sinful creature. All right, so let's kind of break that down a little bit. First, we're creatures. We are created. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we were created by God in the image of God. That's where the name of our church, Imago Dei, comes from. And as, as a created being, as a part of creation, you are not the ultimate control. You are not ultimately in control of your life. You are utterly dependent on him. The creature is not in charge of the creator. Seeing ourselves as more than created beings or not seeing ourselves as totally dependent on him It's not humble, it's prideful. In addition to being created, we're sinful. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that sin has consequences. The consequences are separation and opposition from God. And these things are true of everyone. These things are true for both the the non-Christian and the Christian. You are created and you're sinful, right? Right? You are a sinful creature in desperate need of God. The truth is we need God to remedy this. We can't do this on our own. We can't resolve this conflict on our own. And it's that confession that we, that we can't save ourselves that receives the grace of God. This leads us to our third characteristic. For those who have received the grace of God, for those who have believed in the gospel, for those that are in Christ— Not only are you created, you're sinful, but most importantly, you're redeemed. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So in Christ, you are forgiven. Before, you were separated from God, but now in Christ, you are united with him. Before, you were opposed by God, But on the cross, Jesus was opposed by God, so you wouldn't have to be. The punishment has been paid by Christ. So now you are redeemed, you're justified, you're adopted. Not because of anything that you did. There's no room for pride here. You didn't didn't do anything here. This was all the free gift of God's grace because of Jesus Christ. Jesus values you enough to give up his life for you. So, Because of Christ, you're valuable. Seeing yourselves as as less than this is not humble. Seeing yourselves as insignificant or or worthless is not humble. That's that's self-deprecating and it's, it's not accurate. The cross sets you free to humbly see yourself as you truly are in Christ. A sinful creature, redeemed by God, empowered by the Holy Spirit to live in light of that truth. 
true gospel-centered humility is an accurate assessment of who you are in Christ in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. So how do we live this out? Right? It's the million-dollar question. That brings us to a crucial point that this passage addresses. Peter calls us to live out humility relationally, right? And especially, especially in the context of the local church. So let's turn one last time to 1 Peter 5, 5, where it says, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Okay? Toward one another. Remember, P- the Apostle Peter here is talking to the church. And here's, here's this crucial connection. Here we'll try and tie it all together. Because if you, if you get that vertical component of humility, who you are in relation to God's holiness and your sinfulness, if you get that, then humility can express itself horizontally, right? relationally toward one another. Right? And the recipients of our humility should be those around us, especially the local church. One commentator, Karen Jobes, puts it this way. To say, true humility as opposed to a self-contrived, self-degradation, humiliation, flows from recognizing one's complete dependence on God and is expressed by the acceptance of one's role and position in God's economy. With such humility, one is freed from attempts to gain power and prestige. Instead, humility expresses itself in the willingness to serve others even beyond one's self-interest. So on the cross, Jesus took on our sin, including our pride, and was opposed by God. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, God gives us grace to live as we really are, with humility as redeemed sinful creatures. We're called to live out that humility relationally, right? especially in the context of the local church. So here's, a, I think, a few practical examples of how we can do that, how we can live out humility in community. A humble person is joyful because they get to see the God that they love get the glory he deserves. A humble person isn't trapped by being easily offended because they know that they are not perfect and need daily grace. A humble person is free from resentment and quick to forgive because they know that they have been forgiven much. A humble person is thankful, because they know that everything that they have is a gift from God. A humble person isn't obsessed with getting recognized, but serves others, because through Christ's death and resurrection, he has served them. A humble person is free from anxiety and submits to God, because they trust him and know that he sovereignly controls every breath. And finally, a humble person prays because they know that they are dependent on him. So church, let's heed this call towards humility and be gracious to each other, forgive each other, and serve each other. Now, there are many ways to serve here at Imago Day. Uh, you can check out opportunities in the bulletin. You can stop by the welcome area uh, out back. Or even you could just turn to the person next to you and just ask them, how can I serve you today? The Holy Spirit can cultivate humility in you. God did it with Peter. That same man that denied Jesus three times at the, at the time of his martyrdom, according to tradition, requested to be crucified upside down because he didn't believe, um, he didn't consider himself worthy to, to die in the same manner as his Savior. That's a man that that knew he was a redeemed, sinful creature. And that's humility. So church, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your good and perfect word. But I thank you that we are, that you are God and we are, we are not. God, I pray that you would reveal to us where we're prideful and self-focused. I pray that we would repent of our pride and turn to you. God, change our pride-filled hearts and forgive us when we mess up. I thank you for Christ's humility in going to the cross and taking on our pride and paying that penalty on the cross. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would work humility in us. Help us to see ourselves as we truly are. Make us humble people. Only you can do that, God. 
Give us the strength to live out humility and community with each other, serving each other, being gracious to each other, and forgiving each other. I pray this in Jesus' name.